Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boxing fans around the world. We got some exciting fights this weekend, a.k.a. tomorrow. And when I say exciting, I don't mean exciting by means of the fighters. I mean exciting in terms of what it means for the business and the division and future fights to come. First, let's get into our updates. Of course, we were supposed to have Jose Tito Lopez returning on the undercar for uh, Keith, once upon a time, Thurman versus Mario Barros, which is supposed to happen next week in Las Vegas. Josecito, of course, got hurt. And now he was supposed to fight Abel Ramos. That's now changed. He's got a different opponent, Lucas Santa Maria. And the, I'm I'm noticing a pattern, honestly, with some of these fighters like Jesse Vargas and Josecito Lopez and some of these other ones that are part of that, you know, they're part of that, like, B minus, C plus level of the prior generation of fighters and Mikey Garcia, you know, they're still around, they're still in the business, but of course we're seeing that many of these are kind of falling out a little bit. So uh, they're having, it's harder for them to stay healthy. It's harder for them to stay away from injuries. We're seeing a lot more happening to these fighters. And so I'm just, I'm noticing a pattern. So that's something to keep an eye on for anybody. You know, it, remember Andre Berto had to call it at some point. He technically didn't officially retire, but he's essentially retired. And then Victor Ortiz, he didn't officially retire, but he's technically retired. So we're seeing that sometimes it's hard for them to let go. And then sometimes it's hard for them just to get the fight. Like they can't get somebody to sign on to agree to the fight, a network or whatever. But I think it's getting harder for them to be healthy, harder for them to stay without injuries just across the board. And so we're seeing a pattern. I talked about the, the new blood coming in. And we're seeing that some of the lesser ones, some of the older ones, some of the more war battle torn ones are starting to kind of go get washed out a little bit. So we'll have to watch what's happening there. There's supposed to be a mandatory fight, and I believe it's WBC mandatory. Tyson Fury versus Dillian White. It goes to purse bid. Frank Warren wins the purse bid. He's got 41 million with his bid, so he really wants to put that fight on. Of course, that's because of that's easily because of what's happening with the, you're talking to British fighters, you're talking a big, it is a big fight in, you know, in the UK. I wouldn't call it a big fight anywhere else, but it's a big fight there. And of course, Dillian White, he gets offered a lot of money. They throw a lot of money against people. And it's just, it's, it's, I don't know. So there are a lot of money on the table on this one to make this one happen. So it looks like there's going to be something happening with this fight with Dillian White and Tyson Fury. However, there's still some negotiation that has to happen because even though it's a purse bid, what happens is that the contract gets gets a little bit squirrely. Normally when it goes to purse bid, the, the split is a default 70-30. This was a big thing with Crawford and Porter. What's been happening recently is that they were been, they've been able to change it to be an 80-20 split in favor of the A side. Of course, that'd be Tyson Fury. And so this has been requested for him to get the 80% but that would require Dillian White to agree to it. Now, if he does agree to it, uh, it would still be one of Dillian White's largest paydays ever. So there's really no downside to Dillian doing it. But if we know Dillian White, he's probably going to turn it down and say, no, it should be 70-30 like we talked about. So that's still pending. We have to see how that's going to go. I want to just be clear. There's no real reason to have this fight. There's no real value in having this fight. There's no real positive to the fight. If you're if you're watching the heavyweight division, the fight you want to see right now is the unification with Tyson Fury and Alexander Usyk, or you want to see Anthony Joshua rematch Alexander Usyk, or you want to see Deontay Wilder versus Anthony Joshua. Those are the fights at heavyweight. Please don't talk about Frank Sanchez's boring ass. Those are the three fights I mentioned that we generally want to see in the heavyweight division. We don't really care which one we see, but those are the three that we generally want to see. And I would put the top of that list is unification, Tyson Fury, Alexander Usyk. Second would be Joshua rematching Usyk. Third would be Joshua fighting Deontay Wilder. And people are like, why would you want to see Joshua and Wilder? They're coming off losses. Because they built that so much. You're talking such a build. And here's the truth. From a boxing skill perspective, they're about on the same level. And from a knockout potential perspective, they're about on the same level. And they've had so much hype and so much drive. I said that really, after Wilder took his first loss on the second Tyson Fury fight, he had one loss. And after Joshua took a loss against Andy Ruiz the first time when he got bamboozled, 
I'd say that Wilder and Joshua should have fought each other right then because they only had one loss and they were still considered the top and just had a bad night, basically. So I, I think that was a missed opportunity. It's fine because now they both have two losses. The downside, of course, is that Joshua has one knockout loss. Wilder has two knockout losses. So it's hard, harder to sell it, but I still think it's a compelling fight worth seeing, and I wish they would book that fight. That's me personally. I don't really want to see Joshua rematch Usyk, although I know there's demand for it. I don't really want to see it yet. I really want to see Tyson Fury and Usyk unify because to me, I think we're not having had a unified champion in a long time, truly unified across all belts. is frustrating because Wilder had the WBC for so long. Tyson Fury basically held lineal hostage, which is essentially the ring title, held it hostage for so long. And then he, he goes out, goes on the couch, gets drunk, goes to drugs and alcohol. And we've never had that consolidation. I, that's the one I would want to see is Fury and Usyk unify, get it done. Then you got the top guy here. Then have Joshua face that top guy. Or even better, I think, and I know this will be controversial, get heat, as they say in the wrestling business. Okay, have Joshua, have, excuse me, Fury, fight Usyk, unify, get that done, get one champion, one face. Have Wilder and Joshua fight each other to determine who's going to fight next. We believe that Usyk beats Tyson Fury, but it's not guaranteed. Some believe that Fury beats Usyk, but it's not guaranteed. Then you talk Wilder and Joshua. Well, the only reason that you wouldn't want Wilder to be in the mix is if Tyson Fury beats Usyk, because you don't want to see <laughs> Fury Wilder 4. I don't think people want to see that because we already have a definitive outcome with that fight. But I, I firmly believe that Wilder needs one get back fight, whatever that is. To me, Joshua makes the most sense if Joshua is not going to fight Usyk. That's my caveat. I don't, or Big Baby Miller for Wilder just as a get back fight and then just put him in the mix. That's what I would want to see. We'll have to see how that all plays out. We don't have a solid answer at this point. Makabu versus Mishunu, that, of course, that's happening, and that's going to determine who we think is going to be the next opponent for Canelo Alvarez. Um, we have not had a definitive on this one, but that's the theory. And, of course, Makabu is the one who's in the front run. However, Mishunu believes that he can beat Makabu. He believes that he can win it. He believes that he can upset the, the wagon. And if he is able to win, the, the terms are basically that Canelo would fight the winner. So it's not necessarily Makabu. What we've heard is that Canelo's willing to fight whoever wins this fight. So Makabu is most known, just to put it in perspective, or excuse me, Mishunu, um, is most known for he fought uh, Alexander Usyk in cruiserweight. So when we look at comparison of styles, stylistic comparisons, Usyk is not one that is notable for stopping frequently, quickly fighters. He kind of outboxes you and then eventually gets stoppage or he won't. But when we look at the style comparison, it tells us that Canelo would have an easier time with Mishunu, certainly, than he would Makabu. Doesn't mean that it's guaranteed, because Makabu ultimately is a regional fighter, let's be honest. We wouldn't consider him a highly regarded fighter. We wouldn't consider Mishunu a highly regarded fighter. Mishunu has had, he's had some losses, and he hasn't had significant performances. And the people that he has beaten, unfortunately, he had, he beat a on the way out the door, Lebedev. And that's, it is what it is because he was on the way out the door and he's beaten some titles, titleists, but not, he's never beat the big one. So we have to watch that fight very closely to see what's going to happen here. Andre, Demetrius Andre, Boo Boo Andre, the people, you know, NSB, that's their eye test favorite. Everybody's ducking this dude and everybody else. And of course, he's the most boring fighter in all the, in all the boxing outside of Frank Sanchez. I would love to see a fight between them. Andre and Frank Sanchez. They could stink up the freaking joint and prove to people that these dudes are not draws and they never will be draws. Anyhow, Demetrius Andre, they're trying to book a fight with Andre at super middleweight. We have to see how that's going to happen and we have to see if it's going to go forward. This would be for WBO. WBO has approved it, but we don't know if it's going to happen. So we have to see. And of course, this is Andre is at 160 right now. So he's. He has a title at 160, but he wants to fight at 168. The last time I can recall this happening, some time ago I was doing some research, and I, I don't remember what triggered me to do the research, but it had to do with the welterweight division. And I found some things in the history that didn't make any sense, which was Jose Napolese. Jose Napolese was, he was around, he was born in the 40s, but he was around largely during the 60s and the 70s for the vast majority of his career. And 
What was tripping me was I was seeing Jose Napoles appear as a champion in welterweight, and he was also a uh, middleweight at the time in how he was being regarded, how he was being uh, scored and scorecards and that. So I looked into the history to try to figure out what the heck was going on, and it turns out that Napoles in 1974, he's he's the he's the guy at welterweight. He's the man. You have WBA, WBC in the ring. He's essentially the lineal man at welterweight and he's been defending the title for ages he lost the titles and then he beat and then got his revenge got back he's winning he goes up temporarily to middleweight to fight carlos monzon for the lineal at middleweight so it's very similar to what we saw with canelo where he's currently defending in a certain division he is unified in a certain division and he's going up to another division he jumps two weight classes to go fight this dude carlos monzon who is a beast he loses that one, but the thing is, he was still the lineal. He was still the lineal guy at welterweight. He's still holding the belts, and he actually defended them a few months later in August against Hegemon Lewis. So then, this brought back okay, this jumping divisions that Canelo's doing, and so when I see what Andre is trying to do, it's very similar in the sense that he's a title holder at one division and he wants to jump to another division. I think it's good, and I called out that I thought Canelo, or excuse me, Crawford should have done the same thing. Because that's how you strive for greatness. That's how you get a name for yourself. That's how you put yourself out there. So what's being talked about right now with this one is to fight a guy. Uh, it's called Zach Parker. He's out of the UK. I believe he is. And it's ordered by the WBO. So we have to see what that's going to look like. I don't rate the guy, but it, I do like the the idea of him moving up in weight. Because although 160 is still crowded and for whatever reason, Andre and Charlo can't make a fight happen. And Andre is still an eye test fighter as far as we can tell. He's striving for greatness, and I don't begrudge him that. I do think you need to go after wherever the titles are, and we have to stop with this. We have to stop with I know the dream is to unify a division, and we always want to see that as fighting fans, but I think if they aren't going to happen, you just keep going and keep making a name for yourself, even if it means you move up or down, which is why I've been consistently critical of Terrence Crawford because for whatever reason he refused to just move weight classes so that he can still strive for greatness and not hang on to the dream of unifying welterweight. I know that's the dream. I respect the dream. Spence has the same dream. I understand it. But we know that it's a challenging thing because of egos. We've got egos on Spence. you got egos on Crawford. And because of those egos, we're never going to get it because Crawford's never going to accept his B-side status. So because of this, I would rather you just go for greatness somewhere else and just don't worry about the fans. Don't worry about social media. Do what you got to do in order to push for it. So while I don't rate Andre worth of nothing, I do give him credit for going after going somewhere to not only stay busy, but also continue to try to make a name for yourself, get more titles under your belt, do what Canelo's doing because it's clearly working for him. The dude is the major draw, and he's the A-side. He's the pound-for-pound pound great no matter what ESPN says. So that's on the books. I covered the whole you know Julio Cesar Martinez and him fighting Chocolatito and that one's coming up here soon. I'm very excited to see these fights. I'm very excited to see the, the lesser guys, the smaller guys getting their time in the spotlight. Robson Consequiao, Xavier Martinez, that's also going to happen tomorrow. That's on ESPN. That's out in Oklahoma. Because it's out in Oklahoma, that's at Super Featherweight, by the way. Because that's out in Oklahoma, I don't expect a packed house, which is unfortunate because both guys are action fighters. They're, they're very come forward. We need to make this happen. What's notable about this one, of course, is that both guys, there, there was talks about both guys moving up. Uh, it never really happened. And if we go back in time and just kind of review the history of what's happened here, we, we look at Consequiao, right? And he was fighting Oscar Valdez. And of course, Oscar Valdez failed for PEDs. And Oscar Valdez seemed like he wasn't on his top game. And it was a it was a little bit of a war, but ultimately Consequiao, he's able to do what he needs to do. And so now the narrative is okay, it's a good fight. You got uh, Oscar Valdez was an eye test fighter. He was highly rated because of being eye test. And so going into the fight, there's kind of an expectation on Consequiao's shoulders because of his performance in the past. Martinez is fresh on signing with top rank, which concerns me personally, but. We know that Oscar Valdez is still in the mix at this division, and we know there's still Shakur Stevenson in the mix. Jamel Herring is not retired, despite what popular people say. He's not retired. We we have a lot of smoke at junior lightweight, and so I think there's a lot of fights still left to be made. 
You still got Miss Tegare Russell Jr. saying he might want to come back and go up a little bit and get in get in the mix. So a lot's going to happen. And I would say watching that fight, Consequia versus Martinez, is good to get a sense of what's what that division is going to look like in the foreseeable future with two young guys that I believe are going to go out there and try to try to steal the show. It's unfortunate where they're being broadcast because Oklahoma is not really a boxing mecca. But I kind of understand, you know, with not only with travel, but it's just challenging to get the big fights in like Las Vegas. And of course, because it's ESPN, they will do a good job, I believe, of marketing it. Uh, it's also on Deportes ESPN, and it'll be on ESPN Plus. You want to check that out in the evening time, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. We don't have very many other fights other than those. And then of course, the undercards for tomorrow. Next week is where we start to see a lot happening. We start to see a lot of interesting fights come come to the surface, as I talked about before. That's where we start to see the return of Chris Eubank Jr., uh, Next Gen, versus Liam Williams out in uh, Wales. That's on Sky Sports and ESPN simulcast. Uh, on the 5th, uh, Keith, Once Upon a Time Thurman versus Mario Barrios out in Vegas on Fox, Fox Sports specifically. Uh, Carlos Quadras versus Teresa Quetzal on VZI. Of course, that's uh, out in Arizona, I believe that one might have gotten moved, but as of what I heard, it's still Arizona, but it might have gotten moved. That one's on zone, and then we've got more fights happening immediately the week after that one. So the but this coming, you know, the fifth, we got some action packed fights there. I think all three of those fights are action packed fights, well worth your time. I think tomorrow's fights, for the most part, the cruiserweight one might be a stinker. I suspect it's a stinker. That's in Ohio. Um, I don't know who's broadcasting it. I'm assuming that's a Don King promotion. So I don't know who who's going to broadcast that one. Honestly, it might be only streamed online. Um, looks like it might be. I, I know it's in Ohio, but I'm trying to see who might be broadcasting this dude. I'm not sure because when it's a when it's a Don King, you just don't know because sometimes he does online. Sometimes he's able to get on a network. Yeah. So it says it's an independent pay per view. Whatever the hell that means, it's probably. Something online where you buy it online and then you, you know, dial into the stream and you can see it. That's what I assume because he doesn't really have, he's he's on the outs with most of the major networks unless if he's partnered with somebody else. Like if he, like when he partnered with Al Heyman to make uh, Wilder Stavern because he, he's uh, promoting Stavern. So if he's partnered with somebody else, he kind of just hooks onto their wagon. But if he's by himself, he kind of just does his own thing. He calls it the return to greatness. And so it's probably going to be an online stream, some sort of go on their website and pay for the pay-per-view for uh, Mishu, uh, Makabu versus Mishinu. So if you're interested in that one, by all means, I think it's going to be a stinker, is my opinion. That's just what I think. Uh, that one's again tomorrow out in Oklahoma, uh, Ohio, Oklahoma, Ohio. And then Robin, Robinson Consecchia versus Xavier Martinez is going to be a really good fight. And that one's in uh, Oklahoma on ESPN. That's all I got for our weekend of boxing. So it is a good weekend. It's just that it's it's really the the, the February events that's going to really, I think, catch the sport and catch the eyes of people. It's the one to really watch. But these are going to be de decent fights, particularly the super featherweight one. Be sure to tune in. Check those out. I'm probably not going to be able to see this weekend's fights because there's a lot going on, hopefully. <laughs> Um, but I will be checking out the February 5th, and I will be back to provide coverage on the February 5th ones on the 4th, that Friday. So check back on this. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe to keep the podcast going strong.